Hello, true crimeers. How are you? Extra, extra, read all about it. Way here with another compilation video. Please stop this voice immediately. You got it. That is right, folks. This is another compilation video. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is the official final compilation video. Basically, I have now gotten uh, every true crime video that I want to get off of TikTok uh, now here. So, uh, woohoo! So now, should I ever want to post content there on TikTok again? I can, um, and I'll just uh, basically at that point just save every video I make, um, so they never get lost, and it won't matter if the page is taken away or anything like that. Uh, so yay! <laughs> Sorry, trollies! You can't, uh, you can't do anything now other than take my page down, but it won't matter because all my content is still around now. <laughs> And more pages can be created, <laughs> but I'm not going to. Uh, this is my this is my home now. But like I said in a, a video, just whatever whatever time frame I post this, I, maybe in yesterday's video, I don't I don't know. Uh, I will. My plan now is to start posting my normal schedule of uh, Sunday through Wednesday here, and then I want to start putting a video uh, exclusive to Instagram on Thursdays, exclusive to Facebook on. Fridays and exclusive to TikTok on Saturdays. Um, and so I think that's going to be my plan moving forward. Um, I'll probably do one live stream a week on TikTok. Um, and then I'll do, I don't know, a live stream or two here on YouTube. Don't hold me to that because you know how I am with live streams. I can go a whole bunch at a time and then suddenly fall off the face of the earth for a hundred years. Anyway, 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 shut up, Mike. We're done with this. Okay, so... This is the remainder of the um, playlist of lovers, stalkers, exes, uh, jilted people uh, who have killed uh, out of, you know, or, or, or their loved ones or their romantic partner or whatever the case may be. Along those lines, you get it. This is, I think it was just 22 videos. Well, it's still a lot. Uh, so I rounded it out to 25. Um, I had another short-lived playlist called Old Timey True Crimey, but I only ever did three videos there. Uh, maybe in the future I'll continue it here, I don't know. Um, but those three videos are tacked on to the end of this one, and that, that was basically it. That was the rest of the videos I had, so uh, enjoy. Uh, don't worry, I'll still probably have compilations from my backup page of like the spooky stuff, um, but it won't be as much. Uh, but yeah, so, without further ado, fewer discretion, eh, <laughs> oh, no, is at my... Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Maddie Conley. Maddie was a 19-year-old girl living in the city of Flatwoods, which was in Greenup County, Kentucky. She was described as a very hardworking young lady. She had a lot of drive. She was working two jobs. She was going to college, and she was the mother of a young girl. She loved her daughter very much. She was a young mother, but she was a very attentive and was hell-bent on making sure her daughter had a wonderful life. But, unfortunately, in 2015, her life would be cut tragically short. In September of 2015, Maddie was riding on an ATV with uh, a friend of hers, well, alleged friend, teenager James Ratliff. When they were on the ATV, the story that James gave, along with his girlfriend, 17-year-old Kelly Dummett, was that Maddie was riding on the ATV with James when... Kelly, driving in her car, saw the two of them and became irate and started driving after them. James and Kelly would claim that Maddie freaked out and jumped off the ATV when it was, you know, moving, which led to her dying. But the crime scene investigators knew pretty quickly that this wasn't the case. One, they could tell that her body was actually moved. Several days later, uh, Maddie's body would be found off of Kentucky State Highway 784, and the cause of death was a skull fracture. But she didn't die at this scene. Like I said, she was moved here. 
Not only that, the investigators would also discover that James and Kelly deleted text messages deliberately off of their phones and Maddie's phone, again, in order to cover up the crime they actually committed. Now, it is the belief that Kelly Dummett is the primary source here. She is the person who actually killed um, Maddie. So the investigators were mainly going after her. James would plead guilty to tampering with evidence. And part of his plea deal would be to testify against Kelly, saying that Kelly deliberately chased after them on the ATV with the intent, and she actually mentioned this to her friends, the intent to kill her, to kill Maddie. So James would get a diversion agreement, meaning he was sentenced to seven years, but didn't actually have to go to prison. But he would have to abide by extremely strict rules. Kelly, who was charged with manslaughter, was also given this plea. A seven-year diversion plea, again, not having to serve time in prison. However, she violated her parole multiple times. She fled the state, and she was finally apprehended, and then she was put in actual prison. And this was in 2020. But then she was released again and was put under supervision. Just keep her in jail. She killed someone. Maddie's father obviously isn't pleased with any of this. He has a right to be pissed. It's not justice. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Ashley Young from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Viewer discretion is advised. Ashley was a 31-year-old woman who was on the verge of getting her own apartment, which she had an appointment scheduled with her mom to co-sign on the paperwork on November 29th, 2018. When Ashley didn't show up for the appointment, her mother, Christine, got kind of concerned. This wasn't like Ashley, and she couldn't get a hold of her on her phone. Now, Christine knew that Ashley was out the night before with her friend Jared Chance. So she would call Jared and had to leave a voicemail because he didn't answer. Eventually, he would text her back saying, oh yeah, Ashley's fine, I just talked to her. But Christine knows her daughter well, and she had a very bad feeling that he was lying to her. Ashley wouldn't just miss this big appointment to sign paperwork for an apartment, especially without saying anything. Now, Christine tried to file a police report, but the police wouldn't do anything because Ashley wasn't missing long enough yet. So, Christine did a lot of the legwork for them. She was able to get CCTV footage from a place called Mulligan's Pub that showed Ashley with uh, Jared Chance the night before on November 28th, 2018. The bartender that served them would tell her that they seemed fine, no one seemed to be in distress, and when they both left, they left in good spirits. Now, pictured right here behind me is the home where Jared Chance lived. It was like a shared apartment type building. Now, the neighbor of rejected Weasley brother Jared Chance, pictured here, this is the neighbor. Well, him and his girlfriend noticed a very weird smell coming from the shared basement below. When he went down to investigate, he would uncover some human remains, specifically a torso of a female, two legs, two arms, but there was no head, there was no feet, and there were no hands. This was six days after Ashley's disappearance. The remains would be identified as 31-year-old Ashley Young's. Police investigating the house would find a reciprocal saw with human blood on it. They also found traces of blood in the kitchen that was cleaned up. By January 3rd, 2019, Jared Chance would be charged with murder. And in a surprise twist, Jared's parents, James and Barbara Chance, they would be arrested and charged with perjury for deliberately lying to police with regards to their son. They would eventually be sentenced to 45 days in prison plus one year of probation. Jared would be found guilty and convicted of second degree murder. And he was sentenced to 100 to 200 years in prison. Good luck surviving that one. What was his motive? That was never discovered. He never revealed it. Where's the rest of her? He's refusing to say. What was her cause of death? They don't know. They can't determine that without her head and neck. It was truly a senseless murder. Oh, this is the case of Leo Narvaez, and there is a slight problem. I cannot find any photographs of anyone else involved, or the location involved, so I'm just gonna have to, like, put stock photos up. Sorry. This story takes place in San Antonio, Texas in 1988. So, 20-year-old Leo Narvaez had been dating a girl by the name of Shannon Mann. It was an on-again, off-again relationship that usually had a lot of arguments. It was just there was much turmoil. And so Shannon left him officially. 
and she began dating a man by the name of Ricky Moore. Now, shortly after Shannon broke up with Leo, Leo would then go threaten um, her new boyfriend, Ricky, with a knife. He also, using a pipe, smashed out Ricky's car windows. Ricky called the cops. The cops did absolutely nothing. And then, well, only if the cops had at least detained him. In the early morning hours of April 15th, 1988, 911 would receive a very panicked phone call. It was Shannon Mann. She stated, my ex-boyfriend Leo broke into my house. He stabbed me and he killed my sisters and my brother. When the police got there, Shannon at that point was also dead. Leo had stabbed Shannon's kid brother, Ernest, who was 11 years old. He stabbed him 63 times. He then just unloaded on everyone else. Apparently, Leo was also attacked by Shannon. She managed to stab him in the leg, and I think also in the arm, from what I can see. Allegedly, he was also on cocaine that night. What makes matters worse is that neighbors in the trailer park heard screams and heard desperate cries for help. They were, you know, awakened in the early morning hours. I mean, these were blood-curdling screams. Not one neighbor, not one person did anything. No one called the cops. That is bullshit. I'm sorry, but if you are hearing that kind of screaming and cries for help, call the cops. I don't know if it would have changed the outcome, but who knows? Leo was soon arrested and he was charged with four counts of capital murder, which he was found guilty of doing. And the jury of his peers decided, well, you are being put to death. And on June 26, 1998, he was executed by lethal injection. He had no final words. Oh, well. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of the monster under the bed. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 20-year-old Alice Adams and 20-year-old Tibor Voss. Tibor was originally from Hungary, and he moved to London in 2010. He would quickly find a job at the Radisson Edwardian Hotel near Heathrow Airport, and this was in the Harlington, London area. Tibor became friends with a fellow receptionist at the hotel. His name was Attila Bayan. Attila was an openly gay man, and he had a bit of a crush on Tibor. Tibor was not gay, he was very much heterosexual. But a friendship between the two men would still develop. As a matter of fact, they would end up getting a flat together right behind the hotel where they worked. About eight months or so after Tibor started working at the hotel, Alice Adams would become employed there. And due to her very bubbly and outspoken personality, she became quick friends with Tibor and Attila. Now, the problem is... Attila was a bit of a jealous man. He actually became pretty possessive over Tibor. He didn't like it when he was hanging around other people, especially females. So he was having this sort of like jealous rage kind of slowly building up inside of him, especially because Tibor and Alice appear to be very close. On the evening of August 10th, 2011, after the three of them got off of work from their receptionist job, they would have a little tiny gathering, a party over at Tibor and Attila's flat. They were, you know, having fun, getting drunk. And as the evening winded down, everyone left. And at the end of the night, it was just the three friends. The next morning, Tibor, Alice, and Attila didn't show up to work. They didn't call. Any attempts that they would make to call any of the three people would go unanswered. So friends and family called police to do a wellness check. When they got inside the flat, they discovered two bodies. Alice Adams was laying on the floor fully clothed, and she had been stabbed 22 times. Tibor Voss was lying completely naked on the bed, and he had been stabbed multiple times. It looked like he had been posed. Attila? Nowhere to be found. But he did make a Facebook post. He said, and I quote, I'd like to wake up from this nightmare. Okay, but where was he? Police were in and out of the flat collecting evidence and whatnot. Two days into searching, they would discover that Attila Ban had cut an opening in the mattress where Tibor's dead body was, and he was literally hiding inside of it as they were investigating. He even posted his Facebook post from in the bed. Attila said he blacked out. He knows he killed them, but he can't remember anything. Okay. He killed them both in a jealous rage, and he was convicted. He got 26 years to life. 
A teenage girl would brutally lose her life over summer vacation. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Danielle Locklear. Viewer discretion is advised. In 2014, Danielle was a freshman at Southview High School in Hope Mills, North Carolina. Now, she was originally from South Carolina, but she moved to North Carolina with her grandparents in 2013. She was described as like a really feisty young girl, someone who had like a lot of spunk, a lot of energy, a lot of life, and also a very generous, very kind person for someone her age. She would volunteer and mentor young kids at a local church, and it's there where she met a boyfriend, and that was 17-year-old Jamichael Malloy. They hit it off immediately and became boyfriend and girlfriend within weeks. They had a very rocky relationship. They would break up, they would get back together, they would break up again, and so on. And by March of 2014, the two were in one of their breakup stages. On March 11, 2014, Danielle would ask her grandparents if she can go right down the street to hang out with a friend of hers. And they said, absolutely, go ahead. She said she would only be a few hours, but after a few hours, she still wasn't home. They waited a couple more hours, still nothing. And when it got to the very early morning hours of the next day, they called police and reported her missing. They tried calling her cell phone, but nothing came through. Now, when she initially was reported missing, police would immediately question Jamichael just because he was the ex-boyfriend with a back and forth history with her, but they didn't get anything out of him. And for about three weeks, she was nowhere to be found. Three weeks after she was reported missing, a police officer would notice floating in the South River was two cinder blocks. Unusual because cinder blocks don't tend to float. However, when he got closer, he noticed they were attached to a body. And that body floating in the river was Danielle Locklear. When a human body decomposes in the water, it tends to become more buoyant, which can actually cause them, even with cinder blocks, to float back up to the surface. The medical examiner would determine that she died of asphyxiation and she also had a sock shoved down her throat. Police went back to Jamichael's house and they noticed that there were cinder blocks in their yard. They were the exact same cinder blocks found attached to Danielle. The nylon rope that was attaching the blocks to her also found at the home. They also found her cell phone with a threatening voicemail from her ex-boyfriend just down the street from Jamichael's home. So he confessed. According to him, she approached him that night and said that she was pregnant, which would later turn out to be a lie. The two of them had a fight, and as she turned away, he strangled her to death. His friend Dominic Locke helped hide her body. He got six years. He only got 25 years. An American heiress would be brutally murdered in South Africa. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Gabriella Cabrins Alban. Viewer discretion is advised. Gabriella was born on May 14, 1976, in Los Angeles, California. And her father, his name is Howdy Cabrins. And he's a super wealthy uh, restaurant owner. He absolutely loved his daughter Gabriella, and she absolutely loved him back. They had a very strong father daughter relationship. Gabriella was described as being a ray of light, she was a role model to so many women. And people would say she was just seriously one of the most genuine people you would ever meet. Now, in her college years, she would meet a man by the name of Diego Novella. He, too, was born into an extremely wealthy family. He sort of took the opposite path that Gabriella took in her life. They dated in the early 2000s, but she broke up with him because he had an issue with substance abuse. He had a rocky history with drugs. Gabriella would go on to marry a doctor, start her own marketing firm, but then she would end up divorcing the doctor. Christ. Ugh. While Gabriella is experiencing life, Diego at one point was on the run from the American authorities. He fled the country after being arrested and charged with uh, drug possession, driving under the influence, and eventually that would all get sorted out, apparently. Rich people problems. In 2013, their paths would come back together. This time, Gabriella allegedly fell in love with him. He was still battling uh, drug addictions, but he was trying to get clean, especially for her. In 2015, the couple would travel to Cape Town in South Africa. God, it's beautiful there. 
They would stay here at this hotel, which was about $1,300 a night. And on July 28th, 2015, the absolute worst would happen. Diego completely fell off the wagon. He would consume a massive cocktail of assorted pills. And then he claims he thought Gabriella had turned into a demon. So his brain told him, you have to kill the demon. And he did. He would grab her by the throat and choke her. He then smashed her skull into the bathroom floor repeatedly and then shoved foods down her throat and he killed her. He put a note on her body that said, quote, piece of sh He then allegedly defecated on her face. He then walked down to the lobby, said, I just killed my lady, and then he walked into the ocean. He would be arrested and was convicted of her murder where he only got 20 years. A mother and her son were both murdered by the man they were supposed to trust more than anyone. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Krista and Zachary Stone. This story takes place in Huntsville, Alabama. Pictured directly above me is Stephen Mark Stone, the husband of Krista and the father of seven-year-old Zachary. On February 24th, 2013, Mark would go out and take a random drive all throughout Alabama. He would go all the way down south to Alabama where he then turned around to go back home. Why he did that drive, I don't know if anyone actually knows that. When he got back into their home, he, seemingly out of nowhere and without any kind of provocation, strangled his 32-year-old wife, Krista, which would lead to her death. And then he turned this sudden outburst towards Zachary. The autopsy would show that he tried to submerge Zachary underwater to drown him, but eventually he would kill him too by strangling him with his bare hands. This couple, for all intents and purposes, didn't have any known issues, nothing extreme. Now, the couple had two other children, but Mark didn't harm them at all. And they were home when this happened, they witnessed this but he just loaded them into his vehicle and dropped them off at his parents' house. He would then go into a Huntsville police station and turn himself in. Now, before this 2013 murder, there were no obvious signs of mental illness with Stephen, at least none that he ever made public to friends or family. He was described as a hardworking man who loved his family, he supported them, and then he just snapped. It would be determined, however, that Stephen was schizophrenic. He would go on to express extreme remorse for what he did. And even the prosecutor genuinely believed him when he said those things, that he was remorseful. However, he did still kill two people, and he would be convicted by a jury. And when it came to either sentencing him to death or life in prison without parole, the jury would vote in favor nine to three for life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that is what he got. It's stories like this where I cannot stress enough that we need to take mental health more seriously. If you feel something is going on in your own brain, you know yourself better than anyone. Talk to someone, go seek help. I mean, look, I know a lot of people are embarrassed to admit they have a mental health issue. I have PTSD, depression, all that stuff. And now I'm at a point where I'm totally comfortable talking about it but you still need to take that journey to get to that point. Because if it goes untreated, sometimes stories like this happen. If you know someone who's struggling, try to get them help. Mental health is not a joke. Paint residue and flakes from a gun that was spray painted the color pink would lead to a killer. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Robin Spielbauer. In 2014, Robin was 32 years old, living in Amarillo, Texas. She was the proud and loving mother of two young girls. She would do anything for her children. The father of those two girls, well, hmm, yeah, he's a keeper. This guy's name is Jeremy Spielbauer. He and Robin married back in 2005, but the relationship, well, it just never was meant to be. Jeremy started having an affair with a woman named Katie Phipps. In 2012, Robin and Jeremy would divorce and Jeremy would go on to marry Katie. And then the relationship between Katie and Jeremy, well, that also wasn't meant to be. Katie began to suspect that Jeremy was continuing to have an affair with his ex-wife, Robin. 
Katie said there were text messages between Robin and Jeremy that would lead to her suspicions. Robin and Katie also never had a very good relationship. And typically, that's not going to happen with two women who were involved with the same man. The two women, their relationship was described as very acrimonious and actually led to physical fights from time to time. On April 8, 2014, Robin Spielbauer would be found deceased, laying on a dirt road next to her vehicle. The autopsy report would show that she had blunt force trauma to her head, and she suffered one gunshot to the back of her head. At the crime scene, investigators would find tiny pink paint chips, and there was also pink paint smears that transferred over to the Tahoe's window. Very quickly, Katie Phipps would be questioned and arrested because it was well known that she owned a gun that was painted pink. Not something you see all the time. So Katie Phipps was charged with the murder of Robin Spielbauer. Katie would spend 466 days in jail before police ultimately ruled her out. Cell phone records would indicate that Katie was nowhere near the crime scene at any point surrounding that time frame. But whose cell phone did ping right there at the crime scene? Captain Sixhead, Jeremy Spielbauer. Police would also discover that there was a text message exchange between Jeremy and Robin, which showed plans for the two of them to meet at the exact point where she was found dead. Why did it take 466 days for that information? Plus, he had access to the pink gun. He specifically used it for the purpose of trying to frame his current wife. Jesus Christ, men are pigs. Am I right? Katie Phipps' story never altered. She kept straight to her story. Jeremy's story constantly changed. He was arrested, charged with the murder. He is currently serving a sentence of life in prison. His conviction was momentarily overturned due to jury error, but then the appeals court said, no. Nah. Hell, holy f What is that? Why, why, why are, why are you? Oh. Hello, true crimers. Happy Halloween. So, this is another deadly Halloween. Okay, bye. Ah, that's better. Viewer discretion's advised. This is 55-year-old Liddell Peoples from Chicago, Illinois. On Halloween night 2011, Liddell was hanging out with a friend of his, 49-year-old Maria Adams, who I cannot find a picture of her. I apologize. Liddell got angry with her because a bag of candy of his was missing. I remind you, he is a grown adult. He was enraged over this, and he blamed Maria, saying that she must have stolen the candy. This led to a big argument. Maria took a plate, chucked it at him. That plate hit him in the face, and that's why he has that fancy scar right there above his eye. So what did Liddell do in response? You know, out of anger? He took several steak knives and he jabbed them into Maria many, many times. He was arrested, of course. He was originally charged with aggravated domestic battery and attempted murder. This was because Maria wasn't dead at the scene. She would die later in the hospital. The charge was then changed to first degree murder. I'm having a heck of a time trying to find the exact details about, like, a trial and sentencing. But according to his inmate record from the Menard Correctional Facility, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. So, he'll be locked up until the mid-40s. The 2040s, obviously. Over a bag of candy. He murdered someone, someone he claims to care about, over candy. I don't, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, it. I don't life anymore. This Halloween, folks, please be safe. Thank you. This is the case of Leslie Palacio. Viewer discretion is advised. Leslie was a 22 year old living near Las Vegas, Nevada. And on August 28, 2020, she would be invited by a friend of hers, 25-year-old Eric Ronhell, to go out for a bite to eat. The plan was to go to the Longhorn Casino, which they did. As a matter of fact, this is CCTV footage. The white truck in the background is Eric's vehicle. 
And then this is the two of them walking towards the entrance after their vehicle was parked. Now, this was just a few minutes after 1230 in the morning on the 29th of August, 2020. Shortly before 2 o'clock in the morning, they would be seen leaving together. And it appears she had something white in her hands, possibly like a to-go box. And then the camera picked them up going back into the truck and then leaving. And everything seemed normal. By the way, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm getting a lot of these screen grabs from a YouTube page called Popular Crime. You should definitely check out that YouTuber. So between 1.56 a.m. and about 4.40 a.m., no one really knows what happened. Leslie's sister would text Leslie, where are you at? Leslie responds with, dude, I gotta talk to you about shit. Leslie's sister says, what happened? And you can tell because it's blue that these were iMessages. And you can see that Leslie did in fact read one of the last messages, but then suddenly it goes to green, which means it's no longer iMessage. Her sister says, what is it? Let me know when you're home. But Leslie never responds. And they never heard from Leslie again. No one. Her family would immediately report her missing. The official missing persons report was done on August 30th, 2020. Sadly, on September 9th, 2020, near the Valley of Fire State Park, they would find the body of Leslie Palacio. Her cause of death has still not been released. Police would uncover CCTV footage of Eric Ronhell's house, the man that Leslie was last seen with. In this footage, they allege you can see Eric and his father, and the father's name is Jose, dragging a body and putting it in the trunk. And then the Ron Hell family just completely up and left and moved. And actually, Eric and his father, Jose, would be reported missing. Jose was eventually captured. And actually, just recently, this year, he was sentenced to two years in prison for aiding and abetting a homicide and for hiding evidence, which is just really crappy justice. But Eric Ron Hell has yet to be found. They don't even know if Eric is still in the country, but a warrant is out for his arrest. Sure would be nice to capture him. Guests at a barbecue would complain that the meat tasted a little funny. Gee, I wonder what they were eating. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Kelly Cochran. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Kelly and Jason Cochran were high school sweethearts, and the two of them would get married in 2002 after Kelly officially graduated from high school. And, um, they made a very interesting promise to one another. The deal, the promise, the whatever, was that if either one of the spouses cheated on one another, that the other spouse got to murder the lover. Yeah. Apparently it's someone else's death do us part. Jason serviced swimming pools for a living, but after doing it for 10 years, his back just gave out on him, so he had to quit the job, which means Kelly was left to pay all of the bills on her own. So, the happily, unhappily happy couple, they booked it to Michigan to start anew. Primarily because they uh, could get legal marijuana there for Jason's chronic pain. While working at a factory job in Michigan, Kelly Cochran met this man, Chris Regan. And the two of them got along some kind of nice, yeah. They started porking each other, is what I'm saying. Oh, and Chris was also cheating on his girlfriend, Terry, here. But do you remember the little promise that Kelly and Jason made? Well, Jason found out about this little affair, so oopsie doopsies, poopsie whoopsies, Jason would make Kelly lure Christopher Reagan to their house. And literally, while Kelly and Christopher were going to Pleasure Town, USA, Jason would walk up behind Christopher and shoot him in the back of the head. And then the power tools came out and they would dismember Chris. They then dumped him and the murder weapon in the woods. They then had a barbecue at their home. Guests would complain the meat tasted a little off. According to Kelly Cochran, they saved some of Chris's body and literally barbecued him for the barbecue and fed him to their friends and neighbors. <laughs> Story's not done yet, folks. Police considered Kelly a kind of suspect, but they had no physical evidence. Two years later, they moved away again. When Kelly Cochran calls 911 and says her husband has just overdosed on heroin. Yep. Nope. She didn't fool police this time. Turns out she injected him with lethal doses of heroin, 
It took too long for him to die from that, so she strangled him to death. She was arrested, and she confessed to all of it. Her family says she's probably a serial killer. She'll be in prison for the rest of her life. Good. Jeepers Creepers is just a movie, right? Or was it inspired by a real event? Stay tuned. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Jesus Christ. Uh, are you good, my guy? Okay. This is the case of Dennis Depew. Viewer discretion is advised, and possibly also a therapist. 46-year-old Dennis Depew was married to 48-year-old Marilyn Depew. You're a lovely woman, ma'am, but he is very much Depew. Now, the two of them lived with their three children in Coldwater, Michigan. He was a property assessor, she was a high school counselor. But bubbling and brewing underneath their seemingly happy marriage was a not happy marriage. One full of tension and arguing. Dennis sort of became a recluse in his own home. He accused Marilyn of trying to isolate his children from him. Not true. The children would recall that usually the two of them never really spoke to each other. Well, in 1989, after Marilyn was just fed up with the marriage, she filed for divorce. By the end of 1989, the divorce was official. Dennis moved out, he was given visitation rights. Marilyn changed all the locks on the doors. On Easter Sunday of 1990, Dennis would come over to pick up the kids. The kids were like, mm, we don't really want to go. This pissed Dennis off. And then Marilyn and Dennis began to fight. The kids would report that he pushed her down the hallway many times. They pleaded for him to stop. He then started hitting her. He then pushed her down the stairs, went down to her, and then punched her some more. The oldest child went to go get help, but Dennis had already slumped her over his shoulders and walked out the house with her. And then he threw her in his van. He said he was taking her to the hospital, but they never got there. Here's where Jeepers Creepers comes in. A happy little couple, Ray and Marie Fortin, they were taking a nice little countryside drive. When suddenly behind them, they saw a van driving very fast and almost on their bumper. The man driving the van did this for a while, then he drove past them. The couple then drove past the schoolhouse where they saw the man again, or at least the van. They saw a man carrying what looked like a bloody white sheet over his shoulders, but they kept driving. And then suddenly the man in the van was behind them again, this time riding their bumper like crazy. And it was terrifying. They drove off to the side of the road and then he pulled off a different direction. They went back to the schoolhouse. They found the bloody white sheet and contacted police. The next day, Marilyn's body was found and she was also shot in the head. <sighs> Dennis escaped for a year. Then his story aired on Unsolved Mysteries. That same night, his new girlfriend recognized him. He got in a shootout with police and died. An Ohio man would be found dead in a burning vehicle. Who could have done such a thing? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Troy Timar. Viewer discretion is advised. Troy was a 30-year-old contractor from Deer Park, Ohio. He was a longtime athlete. In high school, he ran track and field. He was captain of the school football team. After high school, he loved to play flag football. He loved golf. And he was always doing like flag football or golf tournaments to raise money for charity. He was just considered an all around fantastic person. In the very early morning hours of the 4th of July, 1999, a Ford Mustang was found burning. When the fire was finally put out, investigators found something horrible. Inside the trunk of that vehicle was 30-year-old Troy Timar. His autopsy would show that he was actually shot to death. Investigators would ask Troy's mother, Donna, you know, do you know anyone who could have done this to him? She knew right away who would have done it. And she blurted out her name, Teresa Voss, that's who did it. Teresa was the ex-girlfriend of Troy. A few months before Troy's murder, Teresa actually broke up with him. But investigators didn't really have anything conclusive to tie her to the murder, especially since she was allegedly the one to break up. They had little forensic evidence um, left at the scene. This is some of it here. 
Now, detectives would question and investigate a long list of Troy's friends, and they were able to rule all of them out. The one person they just had in the back of their minds, though, that they could not totally clear was Teresa Voss. She would give an alibi to police, but over the years, and yes, this took years, her alibi started to kind of fall apart. There were cracks in the armor. The timeline she gave as to where she was that night, it just didn't add up. But the case went cold, again, due to a lack of genuine evidence. In 2005, a cold case team would reopen the case. I don't have a picture of him, but Teresa's brother, Eric Horling, he would come clean about what happened that night. Teresa somehow got Troy out to the spot where the car was found. She shot him dead. The motive really isn't clear. She hid his body under some brush. She then went to her brother, Eric, to help hide the body. He helped her put his body in the Ford Mustang that belonged to Troy's brother, poured gasoline over him, and set him ablaze. The two of them then ditched other pieces of evidence, like the gun. Eric got five years for tampering with evidence, and Teresa got 33 years to life. On a cold night in Boston, the events that would occur to this couple would divide the entire city. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Charles Stewart. Viewer discretion is advised. By 1989, Charles and Carol were married for about four years, and they were now expecting their first child. Charles was a general manager at a store that sold furs, and Carol was a tax attorney. On the evening of October 23rd, 1989, Charles and Carol Stewart were leaving Brigham and Women's Hospital. They had just attended a birthing class. And only a few short minutes later, Charles would make a panicked 911 call from his car phone. His first words, my wife's been shot, I've been shot. On that same night, the show Rescue 911 is filming in Boston. So they jumped on this and they began filming. Now I can't show you the actual image, but I wanted to just have it there so you know it exists. But the footage from the show would capture a gruesome scene. Carol slumped over with a bullet hole in her head. Charles with a gunshot in his gut, writhing in pain. Charles was taken to Boston City Hospital, where after six hours of surgery, he was able to survive. Carol was rushed to Brigham and Women's Hospital. They delivered her son Christopher two months early, but a few short hours later, Carol would die. 17 days later, baby Christopher would also die. He ended up having respiratory failure. Charles spent several weeks in the hospital, but eventually he was cleared and he got to go home. Charles said the assailant was a six foot tall black man. He had a raspy voice. He was wearing a black sweatshirt with red stripes. He tried to rob the couple. Charles then said, this man said, you're five zero," And then he started shooting. And then the city of Boston went to ape shit. Police would go through entire neighborhoods, questioning hundreds and hundreds of African-American men. Racial tensions of the 70s had started to die down. But this cracked it wide open. And now not only cops were questioning innocent black men, but now the African-American community was being harassed and threatened by everyday citizens. It eventually led to the arrest of a man named William Willie Bennett. He just fit the bill, I guess. The reason why I seem so mad is because Charles lied about all of it. Charles's brother Matthew would come forward. Charles shot his wife in the head and then shot himself and then called Matthew to help dispose of evidence. Thankfully, William was never charged. Why did Charles do it? Money, of course. Insurance! Charles was indicted for her murder. So he ended his own life by jumping off a bridge. Four wives, one missing, one dead, equals one hell of a bad dude. Ugh. Can you close your mouth, please? Thank you. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Drew Peterson. Viewer discretion is advised. Drew here was born in Bolingbrook, Illinois in 1954, and that's where he's lived his whole life. In 1977, he became a member of the Bolingbrook Police Department, something he would do for 30 years. Drew would marry his first wife, Carol, in 1974, and they divorced in 1980. In 1982, he married his second wife, Vicki. 
They divorced in 1992 and Vicky would accuse him of domestic abuse. Vicky's daughter from another marriage also claimed that he abused her too. Vicky also claimed that he threatened to kill her once and that he would make it look like an accident. In May of 1992, he would then marry Kathleen Savio. They had a few kids together and then they divorced in 2003. Their marriage also had domestic violence in it, mainly one-sided coming from Drew. Just eight days after his divorce of Kathleen, Drew would marry his fourth wife, Stacy. At the time, Drew was 49 and Stacy was 19. On May 1st, 2004, a tragedy would strike. Kathleen Savio, Drew Peterson's now divorced third wife, she was found dead in a bathtub with no water in it. The coroner would rule her death an accidental drowning. One of Drew's cop buddies at the time would say, there's no way that Drew did this to Kathleen. He is a great guy. Okay. By 2007, Drew and Stacy were living in this home. Stacy was on the verge of getting a nursing degree. Unfortunately, that would never happen. On October 29th, 2007, Stacy's sister would report her missing after many failed attempts to get a hold of her. Drew Peterson said the night before, around 9 p.m., Stacy gave him a call and said, I'm leaving you and I'm going to be with another man. And apparently she left in her 2002 Pontiac, which they would find at the airport. To this very day, Stacy has never been found. But her disappearance would ignite a huge investigation into Drew Peterson. Kathleen Savio's family began to suspect that Drew murdered her. So they requested to have her body exhumed and re-examined. And that is what happened. Another coroner would determine that Kathleen was likely placed in the bathtub after she was dead. She had bruising and scrapes all over her body. She had a gash in her head. They then determined her death was a homicide. And Drew Peterson was arrested for her murder. Stacy provided Drew's alibi for the murder of Kathleen, probably by force. Did he kill her too because she changed her mind? Drew was sentenced to 78 years in prison. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Loretta Bowersock. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Loretta was a 69-year-old woman living in Tempe, Arizona, which is in my neck of the woods. Loretta was the mother of Terry Bowers, who in Arizona, she owned a business that she originally started with her mother, Loretta, um, called Terry's Consign and Design. And by the late 80s, Terry wasn't living with her mother, so Loretta was living alone. And she was lonely. So Loretta would put out an ad looking for a roommate to move in with her. Oh my. <laughs> Enter Captain Minecraft here, Ta Benderly. He responded to Loretta's ad and the two of them hit it off and he moved in. But there were red flags kind of from the get-go. He told Loretta he was from Scotland and he had lost all of his identification. Pretty sus, bro. He said he was also an inventor. He claimed he went to school with Donald Trump. But he had this charm to him and Loretta was smitten by it. Everything he told Loretta was a lie. He's actually an ex-convict. You know, just a little detail that he left out. On December 14th, 2004, Loretta's daughter would get a phone call from Ta. Loretta was missing. He claims they drove down to Tucson, probably an hour and a half, two hour drive from Tempe. He said he dropped her off at Park Place Mall, and when he came back to pick her up, she wasn't there. He said Loretta has just vanished. Oops. Did she, though? Did she, Ta? Well, he filed a missing persons report. Police noticed that at her home was her purse. Why wouldn't she bring her purse and wallet with her on a trip to the mall? Or honestly, anywhere. So then police checked CCTV footage from the mall. Ta and his vehicle, they were never there. No cameras ever picked up Loretta entering the mall or leaving. Police then knew he did something to Loretta and police wanted to bring him in, but it wouldn't happen. When police got to his home in Tempe, he had ended his own life. He hung himself. On his computer was a note that said, Loretta and I vowed over the years that we would spend eternity together. And so we shall. Police didn't even know that she was dead yet. 
But that sure sounds like a confession. Two years later, deep in the desert near Stanfield, Arizona, two people uncovered the skeletal remains of Loretta Bowersock. She had a bag over her head. She was murdered. Loretta found out he was stealing money from her. A lot of it. She confronted him, and then he killed her. And then himself. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Linda Patterson. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, this is an example of a case where, unfortunately, there is very little detail on it. I can't even find the images of the murderers. And I guess that's just really a problem with, like, small-town America and their archives. But I was given the details of this case by someone in my Discord, so I will go with that. Linda Patterson was a 29-year-old mother of three children. And she lived in the town of Sulagent, Alabama. That is not a city I've ever heard of, but a lot of the stuff I've seen about it online, it definitely has like that small town, everyone knows everyone vibe. On August 24th, 1997, Linda Patterson, she needed a night out. So she planned to meet a friend of hers, Jack Miller, to go out and get some drinks. Apparently there were rumors around town that Linda and Jack were a couple, but it was never actually confirmed. But regardless, she loved to party and she loved going out to the local bars. The problem though, Linda, she never came home. And this was a bit out of the norm for her, especially since she had three kids. Two days would go by and her family and friends, they start kind of going to all the bars where she usually would go, asked her friends, asked Jack, but no one had seen her or heard from her. Then on September 4th, 1997, the partially burnt body of a woman was found in the middle of a road. It would be confirmed to be that of 29-year-old Linda Patterson. She had been shot directly in the face. The likely weapon was a shotgun. And then her body was set on fire. Obviously, they do that to try to hide the evidence. It didn't work. Unfortunately for her killer, no one witnessed the murder itself, but there was a couple who saw the burning of something, and the couple was pretty sure they knew who it was. It was her rumored boyfriend, Jack Miller, and a friend of his named Jerry Ray. Unfortunately, the details of why and the motive aren't really known, but Jack and Jerry were arrested, and then they were questioned. And what's known of their story is... Jack was driving Linda back to his place. His friend Jerry met them there. Jerry was holding a shotgun, and for some reason, again unknown, he shot her directly in the face, point blank. So then they wrapped her in a carpet, dragged her body down a flight of stairs, threw her into the back of a pickup truck, brought her into the middle of nowhere, and set her on fire. Jerry had to leave the burn site to get more gas. Jesus. Jerry Miller only got 20 years. Jack got four. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Kelly Joe Snyder. Viewer discretion is advised. Kelly Joe was born in 1981 in Fort Hood, Texas, and she even served some time in the military. She was married to this man, William Snyder, who was also an army veteran. And together they had three children. Most of the pictures online, the kids' faces are blurred out. By 2015, the family was living in Renovo, Pennsylvania. On Easter weekend 2015, Kelly would go to the store just to get a few things. She was expected back pretty quickly because dinner was almost ready. She allegedly was at the store by 5.45 p.m., but she never came home. By midnight, William would report her missing. On April 9th, 2015, about four days after Kelly Jo was reported missing, William said there was a ransom note in his mailbox. The note indicated that Kelly Jo was still alive and they are demanding $60,000 for her safe return. Now the note gave no direction on who to give it to, how to send it. It was honestly quite vague. He then claimed he got emails from the kidnappers telling him to go on this wild goose chase and if he doesn't do what they say, she's gone. He went on TV pleading for his wife's safe return. Too bad it was all an act. On April 10th, 2015, 
William would be formally arrested under suspicion of doing something to Kelly Joe. And he folded pretty easily. He said, yep, I made up the ransom note. The emails weren't real. He said on April 5th, when he got home, Kelly Joe was on the floor unresponsive, saying that she overdosed on hydrocodone and nerve pills. The next day, he changed his story. He said, oh, just kidding, no, we got into an argument. She threw a hairspray can at me. He then tackled Kelly Joe to the ground to stop her, put his hands around her neck until she stopped moving. He thought he just subdued her, okay. No, she was dead. And he told them where to find her. On April 11th, 2015, they found her body in a remote area of Halls Run, Pennsylvania. The coroner confirmed she was strangled to death. William suffered from PTSD. So he tended to be very reactive in moments like an argument. It is not an excuse, not at all. But that is what caused him, he says, to strangle her to death. He even admitted that I, you know, I should have called 911 immediately. He would plead guilty to third degree murder and he was sentenced to 20 to 40 years. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Ali Costiel. Viewer discretion is advised. Ali was a 21 year old student at good old Ole Miss, University of Mississippi and she was entering her senior year there. Allie was considered a lovely, lovely woman by everyone. She was someone who was just shining bright with enthusiasm, happiness. She gave off so much hope to people. She had gone on several mission trips to other countries. People just loved being around her. Allie had this like on again, off again relationship kind of thing with a fellow student of hers at Ole Miss, 24-year-old uh, Brandon Fessfeld. Allie never described him as her boyfriend. They just had a very unconventional tryst, I guess. He isn't the type of person that Allie wanted to ever settle down with. People around school would say he was a very odd guy. Like, some people had, you know, some kind of concerns about him. You know, when, like, a girl didn't want to hang out with him, he would say stuff like, Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> uh. On April 12th, 2019, Allie had texted Brandon that she may be pregnant. Two days later, she sent him photos of what she called an inconclusive pregnancy test. And basically, his response was, Oh, I don't want to see you anymore. And also, maybe you should, you know, take care of the baby. You know, wink, wink. He was really just trying to avoid her for months. That is until July 18th, 2019, when suddenly out of nowhere, Allie gets a text from Brandon saying, let's get together. Now that night, uh, CCTV footage catches Allie just sort of mingling with friends and, you know, leaving a bar. She calls a car to come pick her up. And then the next day, authorities would find the dead body of Allie Costell by Sardis Lake. She had been shot eight times. Authorities were able to use cell phone tracking. And this is why so many people are caught nowadays, thank goodness. They determined that Brandon, in fact, was near Allie at the time of her death. Both of their phones pinged off of a nearby cell tower near Sardis Lake. He had left some detailed note at home saying, I'm going to get caught or I'm going to end up dying. I'm sorry to my family. This isn't their fault. They didn't do this to me. I did this to me. And then a manhunt began. Authorities would find him the day after they found Allie's body, about 90 miles away at a gas station. He confessed to killing her, but he never gave a motive. Authorities believe it was related to the possible baby. By the way, she wasn't pregnant. He was sentenced to life in prison with parole possibility by age 65. He's got a ways to go. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Zuzu Verk. Viewer discretion is advised. Zuzu was born, which by the way is a really cool name, on April 22nd, 1995. She was raised in Keller, Texas, and at the time of her case, she was living in Alpine, Texas. In 2016, Zuzu was 21 years old. She was described as a beautiful and extremely vibrant character. She was attending Sol Ross University in Alpine, Texas. And then she was actually admitted to Texas A&M University, where she was planning to go in the following semester. 
But sadly, that would not happen. Zuzu was dating this man, Robert Fabian. Robert was a very jealous, very demanding boyfriend. Zuzu said that he liked her more than she liked him. She didn't want this big, serious relationship, but he seemed to want that. They were known to fight, and Robert can sometimes get physical. And sadly, on October 11th, 2016, it would become too physical. The next day, on October 12th, she didn't show up for work. She didn't show up for the exam she was supposed to have. Her family would report her missing. She was last seen at this apartment complex with her boyfriend, Robert. Neighbors would report that they heard a lot of, like, loud banging going on. They heard an argument. They heard the shower going at a really weird time. When the family asked Robert, like, hey, where, where is she? He responded with, I'm just giving her some space. I don't know where she is. Okay. Around 4 a.m., a neighbor saw Robert leaving in his vehicle, but Zuzu's vehicle was still there. Four months after she disappeared, a border patrolman saw a little three to four foot deep hole with like a blue tarp covering it. And then he also saw a human skull. They confirmed that it was in fact the body of Zuzu Verk. Robert Fabian would be arrested for her murder. It was reported that an argument they had went too far. The autopsy would show that she died of homicidal violence, but they didn't say anything specifically. It would then come out that a friend of Robert's, Chris Estrada, he helped move her body. He helped dispose of her body. And he confirmed that Robert, in fact, killed Zuzu Verk. He was sentenced to 42 months in prison for tampering with a corpse. About three and a half years. Fabian got life in prison plus 20 years for tampering with a corpse. And he does not get parole. A man would let his girlfriend, who he claimed he loved, suffer for 18 hours before he finally killed her. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Hazel North. Viewer discretion is advised. And I'll have you know, true crimers, this case brings us to Scotland. An accent I don't always do great. Pictured right here was 19-year-old Hazel North, and she's pictured alongside her sister. And they lived in Kilmarnock, Scotland. In 2012, she would meet this man, John Davis, a man who has had some issues with the law. He had actually spent some time in prison for savagely beating another man with a golf club. John and Hazel's relationship had been described as on and off towards the end. Hazel was described as a vivacious, beautiful young woman, finally coming into her own, and all of that would be squashed in March of 2014. Her family would report her missing, and she was missing for about three weeks. Allegedly, John Davis, who I guess took this picture with one of those old, like, Pizza Hut mugs, those, like, clear brown see-through ones, you know? Anyway. He told a friend, I've done her in, and I buried her. The friend, being a good person, went to the authorities immediately. And then the authorities went to John Davis's flat, and they began to search it. From what I can tell, they didn't turn up a whole lot of evidence there, except for a bloody spade and a couple little blood droplets, like, here and there. So police were then going to bring him down to the station just to question him, where he apparently just blurted out out of nowhere, Hazel is dead and I'll show you where she is. Okay. Davis would bring the police to Dean Park, where he claims he buried her body. And they did unbury the body of Hazel North. She was naked uh, and wrapped in a shower curtain. The coroner would report that she had severe bruising to her face and jaw, and also to her eye socket, and she had 14 fractures to her ribs. But what makes it even more vile is, according to the coroner, she was alive for about 16 to 18 hours after the first attack, where her face and jaw and neck were essentially fractured. She survived. And then John Davis finally put her out of her misery that he created by giving her the fatal blows. He then wrapped her up and buried her. Why did he do it? He says he doesn't know. So they have not been able to uncover any kind of motive. He said he did it on March 9th, 2014. John Davis pleaded guilty to her murder where he was sentenced 20 years to life. And for what? 
Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Jessica O'Grady. Viewer discretion is advised. Jessica was a 19-year-old living in Omaha, Nebraska with a couple of her friends. They had a little apartment together. Jessica had a cat that she loved dearly. And even though she was out living on her own, she was always in contact with her family almost daily. In 2006, she was allegedly dating this man, Christopher Edwards. On May 10th, 2006, Jessica would tell her two roommates that I'm stepping out for a little bit. I'm going to go over to Christopher's house. She left her apartment sometime around 1045, possibly a little after 11 o'clock. But after she left, she was never seen again. When she didn't get home later that evening, especially the next morning, her two roommates got really concerned and her family became concerned when she hadn't reached out to them at all. Like I said, it's very unlike her to not reach out to her family at least once a day. And then she doesn't show up to her job, so now they know something is definitely wrong. So pretty quickly, Jessica is reported missing by her family. Investigators, of course, would first toy with the idea that maybe she left on her own accord, but that was quickly squashed when they realized that all of her personal belongings were left behind, including her beloved cat. Her cat is something she would never, ever, ever leave behind. She had a paycheck that was never cashed. They quickly switched gears to, yeah, some foul play had to have happened here. They would then discover her parked vehicle outside of the steak restaurant where she worked. The car was in immaculate condition. It didn't look like anything occurred in the vehicle. They checked her cell phone information and they found out that she also called her boyfriend at 11.48 p.m. the same night she disappeared, the boyfriend whose house she was supposed to be going to. Christopher was obviously questioned originally, but there was nothing to go on. They couldn't get a warrant or anything like that. Not until they found CCTV footage of that night that she disappeared, where he went to go buy cleaning supplies, like late, late at night. This was enough to obtain a warrant. So police began to search the house where Christopher Edwards lived. And this boy does not know how to clean up a crime scene. Oh, they found a lot. They found a goddamn sword, which had Jessica's DNA on it. They flipped over the mattress to find an astronomical amount of blood, which matched Jessica. This dude had the nerve to say, oh, it's just menstrual blood. Look, I don't know how that all works, ladies, but if this is normal, how are you all still alive? Yeah, he was arrested for her murder. Her body has never been found. A witness would come forward to say that Christopher told them that Jessica was pregnant, so this might have been the motive. He was convicted, and he got 80 years to life. Hello, true crimeers. It's time for a new series called Old Timey True Crimey where we will discover that murder has always been a part of us and always will be. And this is the case of Monroe Betterton. Viewer discretion is advised. Lee Monroe Betterton was born on March 24th, 1872 in the great state of Missouri. He was one of 15 children, Jesus. God, he popped him out like Pez dispensers back then. He went on to marry and bed Laura McCoy. They had many children together. Monroe was known to have a bit of a temper, and that temper would rear its ugly head in 1904. Monroe and Laura got into a screaming argument, which then became physical. Monroe would beat Laura into unconsciousness, where she was hospitalized, but then would unfortunately succumb to her injuries. He was never arrested for her murder. Don't worry, Monroe would find new love soon enough. He would swoon Rose Hudson, and the two would also get married. Well, that marriage wouldn't last long either, because on December 28th, 1906, while on a trip to a nearby city in Missouri, Monroe would get drunk, the two would argue, he would pull out a knife, and he would stab Rose to death. This time, he was arrested and charged with murder. He would be sentenced to 99 years in prison. But wait, there's more. September 25th, 1917, he would be paroled and thrown back out into the world. And then he would, ah, son of a ladies. This is why you should have been using Facebook and sh back in 1917. God darn. He would meet another lady named Elzada Lockwood and they would marry. 
1919, the family would travel to Venita, Oklahoma, where they would stay at some in-laws' house. God damn it. Where Monroe and Elzada would get into an argument. I think you know where this is going. He would pull out a pistol and shoot her dead. He shot her three times. He then turned his gun towards other people, and he was stopped, thankfully. Monroe was arrested in Venita, Oklahoma, for murder. He would go on trial in July 1919. He would be found guilty and this time sentenced to death. He would be imprisoned in McAllister at Oklahoma State Penitentiary, where on July 9th, 1920, they placed him in the electric chair and threw the switch. His final words were, Goodbye and God bless you all. And that was some old-timey true crimey. Hello, true crimers! This is the case of the X-Man of New Orleans. New Orleans? Narlins! <laughs> I don't know. Captain Wacky Axie up here is one of the most notorious serial killers in American history, and guess what? No one knows who he is! Was. He's probably dead by now. Unless he's a demon. So, this fella murdered six people and injured six more. At least. Most of his victims were immigrants from Italy, and many of them appeared to be shop owners. But there are many theories about what his M.O. was, what his reason was. Some people thought maybe this has ties to the Mafia? Could this be sex-related? It's theorized that his primary target were females, but he would only kill men if they got in the way. They also think this could have been the works of someone who wanted to promote jazz music. Here's why. So, he sent a letter to the media. They have never caught me, and they never will. When I see fit, I shall claim other victims. I shall leave no clues but my bloody axe. Now, typically, the axe that was used was actually the owner of the house. It belonged to them. He didn't bring his own supplies, I guess. Be careful to tell police not to rile me. Undoubtedly, Orlinians think of me as a most horrible murderer. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. Now, to be exact, next Tuesday night at 12.15 a.m., I'm going to pass over New Orleans, and I'm going to make a proposition to all of you. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils and all the nethers that every person shall be spared who is playing jazz music in their home. People who do not like jazz music, you're going to get the axe. Whatever happened to serial killers sending in letters to the media? That was fun. Now, his first killing was at the home of a local grocer on May 23rd, 1918. I think I was in my late 40s then. And his final kill was on October 27th, 1919. He never stole anything, and it didn't appear that any woman was actually sexually assaulted, so his identity is a mystery. These are some, like, old tiny photos of back then in New Orleans. Now, like I said, he was never caught. The consensus amongst, you know, um, by, like, true crime authors, you know, modern-day detectives who have, like, looked at the information in the cases, was that the axe man was a man named Joseph Momfrey. The killings ended as quickly as they started. He was shot dead in 1920 by the widow of a man named Mike Pepitone, the axe man's final victim. But we'll never really know. You're a trip. <laughs> Extra, extra, read all about it, true crimeers. This is another old-timey true crimey. And this is the case of Carl Panzram, Carl Baldwin, Cooper John II, Henry Panzram, Jack Allen, Jeff Davis, Jeff Rhodes, Jefferson Baldwin, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Rose, John King, John O'Leary. Yes, this is all one man. Charles Carl Panzram was born on June 28, 1891. God. You're old. You're also very dead. He was born in Grand Forks, Minnesota, to a gigantic-ass family. He was one of eight children. He became a criminal at a very young age. In fact, in 1899, when he was about eight years old, he was charged with drunk and disorderly. <laughs> Go f*** yourself and give me my Care Bear, bitch. By age 11, it happened again. He got arrested for being drunk and disorderly. He was released and quickly arrested again. For stealing sh 
He was sent to a state training school where he alleged he was beaten and sexually assaulted by the staff. So in 1905, he burned that f to the ground. By 1906, he was put into another training school where he was accused of stealing again. When he was 15 years old, he enlisted in the United States Army. But that didn't last long either. He was arrested and charged with larceny. That's when he was sentenced to spend some time in Leavenworth Prison. He spent a brief amount of time there and then he was released. Where, guess what? He would go on to steal a bunch more sh**. He stole bicycles. He stole full-on f***ing boats. Where he would be arrested and imprisoned multiple times. He did different stints in prisons in California, Texas, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Oregon again, Connecticut, and Washington, D.C. Where he would use at least 12 different names. Maybe keep him in there for a lot longer time, fellas. But by 1920, he broke into the house of William H. Taft, former United States president. He stole valuables and a gun. He then went on to steal a yacht, where he began to lure sailors aboard, where he would sexually assault them, and then he would murder them, and then dump them in the waters. The only reason he stopped killing sailors was because his boat would sink. He was arrested again in 1921 for burglary. Not for murder, where he spent six more months in prison, then he was released. He then made his way to Luanda, Africa, where he burned down an oil rig. He also said he murdered an 11-year-old boy in Africa, where he said, quote, His brains were coming out of his ears when I left him. He will never be any debtor. Whoa. He then shot and killed six more men in the area. By 1928, he was back in Washington, D.C., where he killed three more young men where he was finally charged with murder and sentenced to death, and he hanged.